Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is definitely a very tragic case. It's really awful how this entire thing was able to happen and I do feel like things could have been done to prevent it. There is also an element to this case of whether or not the person responsible could be held accountable for her actions because of mental health. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what all of you think about this case after hearing the details. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to Audible for partnering with me on today's video. I love Audible for so many reasons. They offer a massive selection of audiobooks, podcasts, and originals across every and all genres. They have audiobooks on cooking, parenting, music, fantasy, and of course, true crime. I love listening to audiobooks while doing tours around the house, taking my dog for a long walk, or especially on long drives or flights. I've been traveling quite a bit recently, with my latest trip being to CrimeCon in Orlando, which was so amazing. I cannot thank everybody enough for being so kind and so sweet to me. I learned so much and it was just the best time. But it also meant that I had a four hour long flight. But the time went by so much quicker because I was listening to such an interesting audiobook called A Serial Killer's Daughter, written by Carrie Rawson, the daughter of the BTK serial killer. For Halloween month this year, I'm going to be looking into some different serial killer cases to discuss with all of you, and I feel like a part of the whole serial killer discussion with these cases it oftentimes doesn't consider what it was like for the family members of the person who is committing these awful, awful crimes. This audiobook gives that perspective of what it's like to see her father, who was a devoted father and husband, a regular churchgoer, and a hard worker, turn out to be such a horrific monster. It's such an interesting listen, and I do highly suggest this one. But if true crime audiobooks aren't your thing, Audible has literally everything you can imagine in their massive library of titles. I also love learning new things all of the time. I also just recently listened to an audiobook called The Psychology of Money, which is great for people who are trying to get better with personal finance and just learning more about how to spend their money and how to save it and how to budget. New members can try Audible for free for 30 days, and as an Audible member, you can choose one title per month to keep for yourself from the entire catalog, including bestsellers and new releases. Audible members also get full access to a growing selection of audiobooks, Audible originals, and podcasts. You can download or listen to their included titles all you want, anytime. You can always find the best of what you love or try something new to discover with Audible. So if you want to try Audible for free for 30 days, make sure you click the link down below and head to audible.com slash Rachel Shannon or you can text Rachel Shannon to 500 500 and note that both are case sensitive. Again, that's audible.com slash Rachel Shannon or text Rachel Shannon one word to 500 500 both are case sensitive. Thank you again so much to Audible for partnering with me on today's video. So with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the tragic murders of Tori and Lily Ball. Tori Ball and her twin sister, Lily Ball, were born on September 12th, 2007 in San Diego, California to Monica McCarrick and Michael Ball. These twins were known to be loving, sweet, and full of life. As twins, they had a special bond that only a twin could understand. But the girls were born into a rough life from the start. Monica, their mother, had always struggled with mental health and drug use for basically her entire life. When Monica was 12 years old in 1995, Monica was hospitalized for self-inflicted wounds and suicidal ideation, as well as intoxication. At 12 years old, she had already started drinking alcohol. This was nothing new though, as she had been self-harming from even a younger age. Then by the age of 14 years old, Monica was diagnosed with attention deficit disorder and was prescribed medication to treat it. However, it appears that Monica may have been actually misdiagnosed, which I think is pretty common with these types of disorders that Monica had, unfortunately. So sometime between 2003 and 2005, 
she had been diagnosed with major depressive disorder. It seems to me that a lot of times adults with undiagnosed ADHD may be wrongly diagnosed as depressed and some adults with depression may present as having ADHD and be prescribed medications that are not suitable for them. So by the age of 12, Monica started using drugs and alcohol to cope with her mental health issues. She started using weed, LSD, mushrooms, ecstasy, and by age 14, she was using cocaine, and then by the age of 18, she was using methamphetamine. From the age of 18 and well into her adult life, Monica continued using meth. She claimed that she didn't use it while pregnant with her twins, but that's just her word. I don't know what to believe. At this point, after we get through more of the details in this video, you guys can make your own assumptions about what really happened. But either way, according to Monica, she used meth almost every day from the time that she was 18 until she was 25 years old. Because of the drug use, Monica became paranoid, she would act out, and sometimes she could even be violent with Michael. There were claims of domestic abuse throughout their relationship. She had been arrested on several occasions for drug use and domestic violence as well. So because of her severe issues with drugs and accompanying mental health issues, her relationship with Michael, the father of her children, did not last. So about a year or so after the twins were born, by 2009, Michael and Monica split up. After the breakup, Monica moved from California to Pennsylvania for a change of scenery. There, she lived with one of her aunts, and things seemed to be pretty calm for a period while she lived there. It was a new change in pace, and things were going really well for her and her children. But in November of 2009, Monica had been on Facebook when she reconnected with an old friend of hers who was living back in California. This man was Robert Paulson, who had a pretty rough history of his own. Robert had previously been dating a woman named Jill, and I believe the two were broken up when Robert and Monica started talking again. But after the breakup and after Monica and Robert started talking again, in April of 2010, Jill took her own life. She had actually used one of Robert's guns to shoot herself, so obviously, this was very tragic and devastating for Robert to go through. So Robert and Monica continued their relationship long distance until May of 2010 when they became engaged. And by the end of August of 2010, Monica packed up her things and moved herself and her twins back across the country to California to live with Robert, her new fiance. Once she was in California in her new apartment with Robert, things seemed to be going very well. She had gone to school and got her driver's license to work as a dental assistant and started working at a dental office after that. She seemed to be pretty stable and happy for the time being. Anytime she needed extra money or extra help with anything, Robert was happy to help. Robert saw Monica as a very good mother who loved her young daughters and just wanted to do her best to take care of them. At the same time, Monica did her best to help Robert cope with the recent loss of his ex-girlfriend, and she understood that even though the two were broken up when this happened, this was a very tragic situation and this was someone that he once cared about, so he needed to grieve through it. However, Robert's job actually required him to travel quite a bit, which did put some strain on Monica. By September 9th, only a few weeks after Monica moved in with Robert, she had to leave and go to Minnesota for a month-long work assignment. Obviously, this wasn't ideal, but for the time being, Monica seemed to be doing okay with the distance. The two spoke on the phone regularly, and Robert made sure to assure Monica that things were going great, that they were happy, and that these work assignments weren't going to last forever. Again, Monica didn't love the distance, but she seemed like she was okay with it at first. But as time went on, Robert and other friends and family members started to notice a shift in behaviors from Monica. Friends said that it was obvious that Monica was struggling. In California, she had a lot less support than she did back in Pennsylvania. 
She was having a lot of trouble taking care of her twins all on her own. She was struggling to sleep. She was very irritable and often went on rambling rants that people could barely understand. According to Robert, about two or three weeks into his work assignment, Robert started to notice that Monica seemed to be deteriorating. She seemed to be very paranoid and was getting upset about a lot of random things. So apparently, Robert and a friend had been writing a script for a slasher horror movie, and the script was apparently about a man who stalked children on a beach, and in the end, everybody in the movie dies. Monica found this script and she became very, very upset telling Robert that he had written this story about her and that he was planning to kill her and her daughters. I don't really know what to make of this script. It is a little bit unusual that a normal person like Robert and a friend would be writing a horror movie together, but there is a lot of people that are just into that kind of thing. Doesn't mean that they're bad people, doesn't mean that they're violent in their personal lives. They could just be into horror movies and it could be like one of these things where you and your buddy want to write a movie, you think you're going to go big time, you think you're going to send it off to Hollywood and they're going to, you know, pay you millions of dollars to produce it. It's a dream that a lot of people have. So this totally could have been what the situation was. But like I said, when Monica found it, she did not like it one bit and she was very suspicious of the entire thing. Then Monica started to say that the only reason Robert started his relationship with Monica and had her move out was so that he could hurt her. Like the only reason he dated her was so that he could hurt her. Then she started accusing Robert of cheating on her with another woman. And this even got as far as her suggesting that maybe Robert was the one who drove his ex Jill to suicide. Then she started to tell him that all of her friends hated him. But Robert wasn't the only person that Monica became paranoid about. She expressed to Robert that she was afraid of a UPS delivery driver who she claimed had entered their apartment. There were times that she refused to leave her apartment altogether because she thought that somebody was sitting in a car outside stalking her. It seemed that Monica's mood would jump up and down and in one moment she would be upset and paranoid. Robert would try his best to talk her down, calm her down, and make her happy, which sometimes did work. Sometimes she would end these calls happy, content, and calm, but then the next day, she would go back to being upset and paranoid all over again. There was one night where Monica had taken her three-year-old twin daughters to visit Robert's mother, Roxanne. Monica, Lily, and Tori all spent the night at Roxanne's place, but right from the jump, Roxanne noticed that Monica was nervous and anxious. It was clear to Roxanne that Monica was having a very rough time managing things while Robert was away. That same night at around 2 or 3 in the morning, Monica took her daughters and put them in the car, telling Roxanne that there was someone parked outside of the house that was watching them. Roxanne told Monica that her car belonged to a neighbor who went to work early in the morning, but she didn't believe her. Monica got into the car with the girls, sitting there texting Roxanne. She asked Roxanne if they were safe to leave until she did ultimately left and took the girls home. At the same time, during the month of September, again, for about the first month of living with Robert, Monica was also texting her friends about some of her concerns. There was one friend from Pennsylvania, Maritza, who she would text regularly after the move. She told Maritza that she was worried about whether Robert and his mother would accept her. She said that she was worried that they wouldn't accept her or her children, saying that she was jealous of the Facebook friends that Robert had. She also added that her and Robert were not getting along at that time. On September 25th, Monica texted her friend, quote, my fiancé, Robert Paulson, and his mom are acting so strange, so FYI, if I end up missing or turn up dead or they try to say I committed suicide, it is a cover-up, so feel free to get revenge for me. Then she told Maritza about the slasher screenplay that Robert was writing, saying that she was afraid that the story was about how he was going to kill her, Lily, and Tori. On September 29th, she texted, quote, they want to steal the girls and kill me, I think. But Maritza wasn't the only friend that Monica was expressing these types of fears to. Monica had another friend, Pamela, who was living in Los Angeles at the time. 
She would also tell Pamela that she was afraid of Robert and his mother, saying that Robert wanted to hurt her. In one text on September 25th, Monica texted Pamela saying, quote, He scares me. I feel like he's going to hurt me. I never meant to hurt him. I need to know I am safe, so hopefully this is a paranoid delusion, but I'm telling you, if I end up missing or dead, or they say that I tried to commit suicide, it is a cover-up. In the days after that text message, Pamela continued talking to Monica and tried helping her through her situation. She suggested that Monica visit her mother. She also helped her set up a phone counseling appointment for October 6th to try and help her out with her situation and to talk about her worries and to talk about what she was paranoid about. Then in the beginning of October, Monica told Pamela that she was rereading Jill's obituary. Remember, Jill is Robert's ex-girlfriend who died by suicide. And she said that she thought that Robert actually murdered Jill that it wasn't a suicide at all. She did use his gun to take her own life after all, and so it could be possible that Robert was actually responsible. These thoughts and fears only heightened when, in early October, Robert called Monica to inform her that he was not going to be returning home after his Minnesota assignment like he was supposed to. He was actually going to be staying in Alaska for an additional 10 days on another work assignment after the Minnesota one ended. So not only was he not going to be able to come home and see her before his next work assignment, but he had to go straight from Minnesota to Alaska, so he wasn't going to be able to see her at all. When Robert told her this, she became very upset, and her and Robert fought about it over the phone. After this, her concerns and worries got worse and worse. Now, I do believe this was a different day than the day that Monica and her children left Roxanne's house at 2 or 3 in the morning. It's not totally clear with the sources that I read, but I believe it was after finding out about the Alaska trip, Monica and the twins were at Roxanne's house again hanging out and eating pizza, so she was just there for dinner this time. Monica said, though, that the pizza made all three of them sick, so this confirmed her belief that Roxanne and Robert were trying to kill her. She was convinced that this pizza was poisoned. At that point, Monica started to believe that Alaska wasn't a work trip. Instead, it was a plan by Robert to kidnap her, Lily, and Tori, and put them into a sex enslavement camp in Alaska. Then, after suspecting pretty much everybody close to her in her life of wanting to harm her, she started to see other people wanting to harm her pretty much all around her. Everybody that she saw in her day-to-day -day life, she was suspicious of. On October 10th, 2010, Monica had gone to the front office at her apartment complex to talk to one of the managers, but it was a Sunday, so the office was closed. But to her, the fact that it was closed was very suspicious. She thought that it was closed because this is where people were congregating and setting up operations to kidnap her and her daughters. She was convinced that there were helicopters watching her outside and she thought that they were coming for her. By October 11th, 2010, Monica had called Tori and Lily's paternal grandmother or her ex Michael's mother, Faye, to ask them who was going to take the girls. In that phone call, Faye said that Monica sounded irrational and erratic. To Faye, she thought that Monica was probably trying to ask her for help with caring for the twins, so she said that if Monica brought the twins to her home in Southern California, that she would start proceedings to get custody of them if that's what Monica wanted. But she ended up telling Faye that her current fiance, Robert, was kicking her out because he had some sort of vendetta against her. But from what we can tell, that wasn't true. It doesn't seem like Robert was kicking her out. It seemed that she either made this up or more likely that she thought this was true even though it wasn't actually true. She might've just thought that Robert was trying to kick her out even if he actually wasn't. Then, on the morning of October 12, 2010, the assistant manager of the apartment complex where Monica lived asked her to move her car because it was blocking some of the other parking spots. However, when the assistant manager arrived, Monica would not open the door. The assistant manager asked her why her car was parked that way and why she wasn't able to open the door, and Monica didn't have much of an answer. 
but later we would find out that Monica didn't want to leave the apartment because she heard noises in the ceiling and thought that people were coming to get her. Eventually, the assistant manager did get Monica to open the door, leave the apartment, and move her car, and she watched Tori and Lily as Monica did this. Monica would later say that she trusted the apartment's assistant manager to watch the girls while she moved the car, even though she thought that, you know, the apartment was setting up operations to kidnap her and her children. She trusted this woman in particular because she was pregnant and the majority of people who hurt women are men. That is what she said for why she trusted this woman. If it was a man who came to the door, she probably would not have opened her door at all. Then, that same morning, the manager at the apartment complex noticed that Monica had submitted a work order to have the locks on her door changed. A few hours after that, Monica called the office to see if the locks had been changed, and on that phone call, the manager heard the twins crying in the background. At that time, Monica asked the staff members if they could help her take care of her girls. Obviously, they were not going to help her with this, though. That same day, Monica began messaging different people, saying a bunch of different bizarre things. So first, that same evening, she was texting Robert saying that he needed to come home and that she missed him. This progressed to her talking about robot butterflies, which Robert said made no sense. Then she started telling him that he was never going to have her again. In another message, she gave Robert a message that she wanted him to tell Michael, the father of her children. She told Robert to tell Michael, quote, let the bunnies go forever so we can keep what's ours. Apparently, according to Robert, he thought that Monica was trying to say that Michael needed to give up parental rights of the girls so that Robert could adopt them. Later in the evening, Monica then messaged Robert saying TikTok, and after that, she sent a message saying, read James Patterson. A bit after that, Robert and Monica finally had a chance to talk on the phone. In that phone call, Robert said that she sounded absolutely incoherent. She was rambling, her words were all jumbled around, and she sounded like she was in a hurry, running around the house and doing God knows what. She would hang up, and then he would call her back, and this happened over and over and over again. During one of those calls, one source reported that Robert heard fire alarms going off in the background. When asking about the fire alarms, she told Robert that it was okay, they were just making some fire. So her and the twins were making some fire in the apartment. After several times of him calling her back and her picking up and rambling nonsense to him and hanging up, she hung up this last call and eventually stopped picking up his further calls. Apparently, after this last call, Robert called his mother and told her that Monica has absolutely lost her mind. Then, by around 10 p.m. that same day, on October 12th, 2010, a downstairs neighbor started hearing the sounds of a very loud thumping sound coming from his upstairs neighbor, Monica's apartment. This was located on the third floor. About an hour or two later, he heard the fire alarm going off along with other neighbors who started to see smoke coming from the windows of her unit. The downstairs neighbor immediately ran upstairs to check on his upstairs neighbor, trying to kick in the front door to get inside, but the door was blocked. He did actually get it open just a little bit, but as soon as he cracked it open, he said that he felt such immense heat that it actually pushed him back. He wasn't able to get the door open enough to actually get inside. But he did actually find a window on the back side of the apartment and was able to break in through the window. And upon walking in, he found a katana-style Japanese fighting sword on the floor, which was covered in blood, and then he saw a bottle of pills lying on the ground. Now, after seeing that, the neighbor decided that he needed to get out of there as soon as possible because who knows what could have been going on. Somebody could have been in that apartment to kill Monica and set a fire and he could still be in there and might want to get rid of any witnesses. He had no idea what was really happening. So, of course, firefighters were also called to the scene immediately and all of this was reported to first responders. When firefighters got to Monica's apartment, they obviously had a hard time opening the door because, again, it was blocked. But they were able to force the door open and enter inside. 
They then found the source of the fire, which had been lit in the closet near the front door. They were able to put that fire out, but when they got inside and put the fire out, they saw a horrific scene. They quickly found the bodies of three-year-old little Tori and Lily. One of their bodies had been blocking the door, which is why everybody had such a hard time getting in. Both girls suffered obvious severe lacerations to their tiny bodies and both girls were pronounced dead at the scene. Then in the kitchen, they found 28-year-old Monica lying on the ground unconscious, also with lacerations to her throat and wrists, but she was still alive. So the firefighters carried her out of the apartment and got her into an ambulance for treatment. After assessing the scene and taking care of the bodies, first responders then took a look around the scene. First, they found an assault-style rifle in the living room, as well as a box which contained a loaded handgun with more live rounds in the box. In the hallway, they found a straight-bladed sword, which was covered in blood. Then there was a lighter with blood next to that as well on the floor. They found that the two high chairs had been knocked over in the dining room, both of which had their food trays removed, and both high chairs were absolutely soaked in blood. Then there was a table facing the high chairs. On that table, there was a laptop open, and it was playing a children's cartoon. In the kitchen, there was a landline phone on the counter, but the phone and the countertops were covered in blood. In the bathroom, the sink faucet had been left on, so the water was still running from it. The counters and the sink in the bathroom were all covered in blood as well. There was a cell phone on the floor in the bathroom as well, and then there was a stool in the bathroom, and on that stool, they found a James Patterson book called Double Cross. Double Cross is a thriller suspense book about a crazed serial killer where each killing becomes more and more complicated as the detectives try to solve the crime. This book was opened and turned to a page that read, My Daughter is Dead, somewhere on that page. Then after finding these tiny bodies, of course, they were sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. The medical examiner found that three-year-old Tori had 11 cutting wounds on her face, two cutting wounds and a gaping wound on her neck, nine superficial cutting wounds on her chest, two deep stab wounds to her chest, one of which penetrated her heart with the other penetrating her lung. Then they found that she had three small superficial cutting wounds as well as one deep stab wound to her abdomen. They found several wounds on her arms and hands, which were consistent with defensive wounds. Lily had five cutting wounds to her face, four cutting wounds to her neck, and nine to her chest. She had one large gaping wound on her neck as well, which severed her larynx and cut her carotid artery, almost decapitating her. She had multiple defensive wounds to her arms and hands, and a six-inch deep wound to her abdomen. Neither girl had inhaled smoke, so that meant that they were both dead before the fire was started. Obviously, this is just tragic. The fact that they had these defensive wounds says to me that they were alive, obviously, when their mother was attacking them, and they were aware of what was going on. They knew that their mother was hurting them, but they had no idea why. I can't even imagine how this entire thing started and progressed with one girl who had to sit there and watch as her mother attacked her twin sister, being able to do nothing about it until she turned around and attacked her as well. It's just awful to think about. The level of injuries these poor children had is just brutal and I can't even begin to describe how disgusting it is. There was a lot of questions as to why, you know, there was a gun sitting right there. Not that it makes it any better, but why would she choose to inflict this level of injury on her children to the point that they were still alive and they probably felt so much pain as their mother was slashing them and brutalizing them when she could have just shot both of them in quick succession and made it painless and quick as possible. Again, not that it makes it any better, not that that would make the situation any better, but 
I have no idea why she went this way of wanting to cut them and hurt them and do all of this to her children to kill them and put them through this much pain and this much brutality. It just does not make any sense. Then, when Monica arrived to the John Muir Medical Center for treatment, she was in critical condition. She had two large lacerations to her throat, as well as multiple cuts and lacerations on her arms and wrists. On one of her arms, she cut so deeply that the tendons that flex your wrist and fingers was completely severed, so about right here. She had a large laceration on her thigh, as well as lacerations to each ankle, both of which had completely severed her Achilles tendons, which is unimaginably painful. Can't even imagine what that was like. At that time, she was tested for drugs and it was actually negative for alcohol, cocaine, and meth or any other drug for that matter. At the time, to police, it appeared like this was a murder-suicide attempt. It looked like Monica had murdered both of her daughters by slashing and cutting and stabbing them before carrying their bodies to the door to block the door shut. Then she cut herself all over the place and set the apartment on fire, either to make sure that she and her children had died or to cover the evidence of what happened in that apartment. While receiving treatment in the hospital, police charged Monica with two counts of murder, two counts of child abuse resulting in death, one count of arson, and one count of destruction of evidence. By October 14th, 2010, it appears that Monica was released from the hospital and booked into Solano County Jail. She pleaded not guilty to her charges by reason of insanity, and from there, she went through multiple psychiatric evaluations to determine if her mental health is to blame for her actions and if she truly knew that what she was doing was wrong. So, there were three different doctors who evaluated Monica, and they all had similar findings, but they kind of had different ways of getting there and different evidence that they brought forward when writing their evaluation. So, I'm going to sort of try to combine and summarize what each doctor said without getting too repetitive or redundant. First, we have Dr. John Shields, PhD. Dr. Shields spent a total of 20 hours with Monica over the course of nine sessions. As we heard from before, he talked about how she had mental health issues from the time that she was a preteen. By 12, she was drinking excessively and was involuntarily committed to the hospital for mental health treatment after self-harming. By 14, she was diagnosed with ADHD, but Dr. Shields believes that she should have been diagnosed with bipolar disorder with psychotic features as well as delusional disorder. He believes that her misdiagnosis contributed to her polysubstance abuse. Between 2003 and 2005, that is when Monica first reported having delusions and excessive paranoid thoughts. It was also around that time, as we know, that she was using all sorts of drugs. She did math pretty much every day until she was 25, and text messages from the days surrounding the killings indicate that she was using again in October of 2010. Again, she did test negative on the day of the killings, but that doesn't mean that she wasn't using in the weeks or days before that. In one text message to Robert sent on October 10th, she wrote, "'You wanted me to stay thin and said it was important and okayed me to use to do that.'" most likely referring to meth use, which does suppress your appetite and makes you not want to eat at all, so people who use meth regularly will be very underweight, will be very skinny, and you can sort of see like they have like a gauntness to their face because they just don't eat. Now, as many of us know, especially if you've watched Breaking Bad or any of the other drug shows for that matter, one of the biggest side effects of meth use is paranoia, delusions, and hallucinations. This is especially prominent in long-term users, and these effects can continue happening long after someone stops using meth. Dr. Shields concluded that she was highly intelligent, but she did not show any significant probability that she was faking her mental illness. She was clearly suffering from severe mental illness. She wasn't faking it. She wasn't exaggerating it. He thinks that her long-term drug use contributed to her delusions that she was being stalked. 
She thought that someone was going to take her and her daughters, separate them, and put them into a slave encampment where they would all be raped, tortured, and killed. She believed that this UPS driver had keys to her apartment and that he was a part of the conspiracy to kill her and her children. She believed that she was seeing messages warning her of the kidnapping embedded in the TV shows and cartoons that her children were watching. That is how deep her delusions went. She basically saw everything in her day-to-day -day life as confirmation that people were trying to kill her. Again, she thought that Robert being sent to Alaska confirmed that he was a part of this conspiracy to kidnap her and send her to a camp in Alaska. Then we know about how she thought Roxanne was in on it and poisoned the pizza that they were eating. Dr. Shields concluded that she was so delusional that she thought that the only way to save herself and her children was to kill them and herself before they got the chance to capture them and enslave them. He believes that in the time of the killing, she was unable to recognize the moral or legal wrongfulness of her actions. Therefore, she was insane at the time of the killings. The next doctor to evaluate Monica was Dr. Pablo Stewart, MD. He also pointed to her significant meth use between the formidable years of 18 to 25 years old. And he does think that this contributed significantly to her paranoid delusions. He believed that Monica was in a state of psychosis and was suffering from delusions when the killings took place. He said that Monica reported using meth only once a week in the weeks leading to the killings. So, he doesn't necessarily think that meth withdrawal was responsible for the delusions. He thinks that her depression got significantly worse after moving to California and that her mental health contributed to her psychosis. Once again, he concluded that she did not understand that her actions of killing her children was legally or morally wrong. The last doctor to evaluate Monica was Dr. Janice Nakagawa, PhD. Monica told her that in the days before the murders, she armed herself with a gun and a sword and sat in front of the door and just stared at it for hours on end, waiting for someone to come inside and take them. She also said that she had packed up all of the stuffed animals and teddy bears because she thought that they had cameras in their eyes. So, she wanted them put away somewhere else so that they couldn't watch her. Dr. Nakagawa described how her paranoid delusions were also in part because of the book Double Cross. This book describes multiple ways in which the killers hunt people, and one of them is by taking women to an island and hurting them. Monica believed that this is what Robert was planning on doing to her. She told Dr. Nakagawa that she burned the apartment down because she didn't want Robert or her family to know what she did. If they found out that she killed her kids and herself, that her family would become involved with the people who were plotting to kidnap and kill her. Basically saying that if they found out, Robert was going to go after her family next, so she didn't want it to be obvious that she was the one who killed her kids and killed herself, so that's why she set the apartment on fire. Now, there were texts to Robert in the days before the killings, which showed that she was acting normally and not paranoid at all. However, Monica told the doctors that she was acting normally towards Robert on purpose because she didn't want him to know what she was about to do. She said that she decided on October 10th that she was going to kill the girls. So, for the two days after that, she didn't want Robert to figure out what she was planning so that he could come back and kidnap her before she got the chance to kill her kids and herself. Once again, this doctor did not believe that Monica knew her actions were wrong when she committed these murders. However, there were other things about Monica that maybe the psychiatrists didn't consider that maybe show she was a little bit more coherent and maybe had different motives than anybody thought. While awaiting her trial in jail, there were some things that Monica did that concerned those involved in her case. And at the same time, the prosecution was working very hard to try to prove that Monica was not insane at the time of the killings and that she did understand what she was doing. Now, at that point, she had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, and adjustment disorder. She had been medicated for these disorders, which said to all the psychiatrists that she truly was 
was psychotic. But while in jail, apparently she told another inmate to cut herself and start hearing voices so that she could go to the hospital and meet her there and not take accountability for what she did. That is concerning because that kind of shows that she knew exactly what she was saying to those psychiatrists. Then there were text messages that came out which showed that Monica may have known what she was doing, that she was still doing drugs, and that maybe she saw her children as an inconvenience to her, not as much as the little girls who she so desperately wanted to save. In one text message she sent to Robert, she basically said that she's overwhelmed with the girls and that she wishes that she was young and free again so that she could go out and party and not have so much responsibility. Then, in September, she texted Robert again saying, quote, I am dying to smoke. I'm leaving them alone here. They probably won't wake up, but I can't help it. It's too hard to bring them everywhere. Then in another text, she wrote, I need some free time or I'll snap. They also brought up how, like I just mentioned, Monica told Dr. Nakagawa that she packed up all of the stuffed animals because they had cameras in their eyes. But when the girls were found, one of them had been wearing a teddy bear harness. So if she truly thought that these animals had cameras in their eyes and she packed them all up, why did one of the girls have a stuffed animal at the time of her death? All of the psychiatrists also conceded that they did not think that Monica was actively using drugs at the time of the killings, but multiple text messages indicate that she was actively using meth in the weeks before the killings. They also conceded that they didn't consider the text messages, like saying that she needs to smoke, saying that the children are such a big inconvenience for her that she, you know, needs some free time to herself. The psychiatrist said that they did not see those messages when writing their evaluation, so those are not things that they took into account. Now, meth is a drug that acts very quickly and therefore leaves the system very quickly. Depending on the dosage, the user's metabolism, the frequency of use, and other factors, meth can be detectable in your system for up to three to five days at most, depending on the drug test that is used. Some other sources say that it can be out of your system in as few as two days. So if we are to use the higher end of the scale to be fair, she could have smoked meth five days before the murders and the drug test could have still come back clean. That would fit if she really was using meth once a week and was starting to use again. And even if the drug is out of your system, people can still experience long-term side effects. Again, even if you don't have an accompanying mental health disorder, one of these biggest side effects is paranoia and delusions. According to court documents, a defendant cannot be found insane solely on the basis of addiction to or abuse of intoxicating substances. This provision, quote, makes no exception for brain damage or mental disorders caused solely by one's voluntary substance abuse, but which persists after the immediate effects of the intoxicant have been dissipated. Rather, it erects an absolute bar prohibiting use of one's voluntary ingestion of intoxicants as the sole basis for an insanity defense, regardless whether the substance caused organic brain damage or settled a mental health disorder, which persists after the immediate effects of the intoxicant have worn off. So based on the fact that the courts believed that her reason for these delusions and paranoia was mostly because of her drug use. And even if it was an underlying mental health disorder, the Matthews obviously made it come out and made it a lot worse. The jury felt that Monica did not meet the burden of proof necessary to show that she was insane at the time of the crimes and that it wasn't because of her drug use. So, she was found mentally competent to stand trial. Which, just as a side note, I absolutely appreciate and agree with that rule. I already think that the insanity plea is stupid because you should be held accountable no matter what if you are responsible for the taking of another life. But even more so, if you ingest something that you know is going to alter your mental state, because again, when you do drugs, it's not because you think that it's going to make you feel exactly the same. You know it's going to have an effect on how you're thinking and what you do and your actions, whether it be weed, cocaine, alcohol, meth, mushrooms, whatever. I don't care how these drugs affect you. I don't care what drugs it is. I don't care if they're legal like alcohol or weed. If you kill someone because you are really drunk or really high or you were paranoid or you were on drugs or whatever... I don't care. You still took someone's life and you still should be held accountable. 
Case closed. So because of this, by June of 2012, Monica's trial for two counts of first-degree murder started. The jury heard the evidence that we've been talking about throughout this video. The Matthews, the mental health issues, the paranoid delusions that she experienced. The big question was, did she kill her babies because she really thought she was saving them, or did she just see them as inconveniences? Was she just overwhelmed, wishing that she could be free to party and do drugs without the burden of her two twin girls weighing her down? After hearing all of the evidence, which is pretty much what I've been discussing throughout the entire video, I don't want to go over all of it again because that would be redundant. After hearing all of the evidence, she clearly did murder her children and she did use drugs. She clearly had some sort of mental health issues, but at the same time, even though she was paranoid, even though she was telling, you know, all these friends and family members that she was paranoid, that Robert was going to hurt her, she also showed evidence that she simply was getting tired of being a mother and that she needed either a break or she just didn't want to be a mother anymore. So, by June 15th of 2012, the jury found that Monica McCarrick was guilty on two counts of first-degree murder as well as assault on a child causing death. By October 4th of 2012, the jury sentenced her to two life terms without the possibility of parole for the murders, as well as two additional sentences of 25 years to life for the charges of assault causing death. According to sources reporting on the trial and sentencing, Monica expressed her deepest sorrow for what she did. I'm using air quotes because that is an actual quote. She said that she felt really bad for what she did and that she was deeply remorseful to the courts, as well as to Michael, the father of her children, she went on to say, quote, I pray for all of you every day, and I wish there was something I could do to ease the pain for both of our families. I love Tori and Lily more than anything in the world. Michael also took the stand to express to the judge that he doesn't want leniency for Monica. He referred to her only as the defendant, never saying her name or addressing her. What she did is just inconceivable and unforgivable, and he is devastated at what she did. He said that he is going to miss the joys of being a father and that nothing will ever bring his twin girls back. So that is pretty much where the case ends. Obviously, this is one of the most devastating crimes that you can imagine, I cannot express how awful I think these girls' deaths must have been, but I will say that I am so happy that she had to take responsibility for what she did to those girls. Like I said, I don't think smoking meth is a reason to be able to say that you aren't responsible for murdering your two daughters in such a brutal way. And I personally think that the reason for this wasn't just one or the other. When someone is so paranoid and delusional, it's not like they only have that one way of thinking all of the time. So I personally think that it was a little bit of both. I do think that she really did have times where she thought she was being watched and hunted. But I also think there were other times where she was frustrated and felt overwhelmed and got sick of being a mother. I think both can be true at the same time and I think both did contribute to the crime. I don't know what state of mind she was in when she murdered those girls, but I don't think anybody is ever in the right state of mind when they kill someone. So do I think she was in the right state of mind and a proper state of mind when she murdered her daughters? No, obviously not. Do I think something made her snap and act out? Yes. Do I think she is regretful and remorseful? Yes, but I also do think that she knew what she was doing and for whatever reason, she thought that her life would be better without them. I also do think that she might have fully intended on killing herself. She did give herself some pretty gnarly injuries, like she literally severed her Achilles tendons, she severed other tendons, she had very deep wounds. It's not like other cases where someone's trying to fake that they got attacked and, you know, have all these superficial scratches all over their bodies. I do think that she wanted to die and I think that she cut herself all over with the intention of doing that. But regardless, Monica knew that she had other options. I don't know why she had to take her girls down with her if she truly wanted to die herself. I think that's just something I will never understand when people like this will kill their children and then either kill themselves or try to. It just doesn't make any sense to me. I 
obviously doesn't make sense to anybody else except for the people that do these things. I don't think any normal person could understand why this happens. But regardless, Monica had other options. She knew that she could have given the children back to her ex if she really thought that they were such a burden or that Robert was going to take them. Her ex's mother literally said that they would take the children from her and that they would take care of them. And I'm sure it could have been a completely cordial and normal situation if she really didn't think that she could handle the children. Or if she thought that their lives were in danger, she could have given them to Michael and his mother and let them take care of them while she was figuring out you know, what these people were doing to try and kidnap her or whatever. I just think that there were so many things that went into this crime, but I do think at the end of the day that Monica knew what she was doing, but I do think that she knew what she was doing to an extent. I think that she knew it was wrong, and I do think that that is why she tried burning the house down because if she got rid of all the evidence, then no one could see what she did, and nobody would know that she's the one that murdered her children or you know, that she cut them and hurt them in such a horrific way. I don't know what her mindset was. I don't think we will ever know. I don't think any, of you know, person that kills their kids or kills another person, I don't think we'll ever know, like, what is going through their head when they are doing it and when they think that this is the right thing to do. But at the end of the day, this is what she chose to do and she is serving time for it and I'm very happy about that. But that is all I have for today's video. And now I really want to hear what you all think. Do you think that she was insane when she killed those girls? Do you think that she really thought she was saving them or do you think she got sick of being a mother and wanted them out of the picture? Let me know any thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All are going to be linked down below. If you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which also will be listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.